Hi, I'm Wendy here at the Osterville Village Library, and for today's first chapter Friday, I'd like to share a book with you called City of Gold by Will Hobbs. And I'll start with the flyleaf for you. Weeks after arriving in Colorado, 15-year-old Owen Hollowell wakes to see a rider in the moonlight stealing the family mules. Hearing they'll likely be sold to the mines, Owen sets out to track the rustler over the mountains. Little brother Till insists he's going along, but Ma says no because he's only nine. The outlaw's trail leads to Telluride, the tempestuous city of gold. With the help of a girl from the bakery, Owen is onto the culprit, but gets nowhere with the town's notorious marshal. Hours after Till shows up on the train, the brothers head for the lawman's office. Owen spots the mule thief in a photo of Butch Cassidy's Wild Bunch. More than interested, the marshal leads the boys on horseback into the canyon country and all the way to Robber's Roost. For readers who love adventure and humor, Will Hobbs has spun a tale of two brothers up against a mining company and a famous robber. Only their wits and their courage can bring them home. Chapter one, it's your misfortune. Our mules were wickering in the dead of night. Hercules and Peaches were in distress and trying to get my attention. Something was wrong, but I wasn't able to do a thing about it. For some reason, I couldn't even move. Their whinnies turned into squeals of terror. Wake up, Owen, my father was saying. Pa was at my bedside, shaking my shoulder. The barn's on fire. Now that I'd scared myself awake, I found myself not in my bed back in Kansas, but on the kitchen floor of a two-room house in southwest Colorado. Moonlight was pouring through the kitchen windows, and it took me a couple of seconds to get my bearings. Pa was eight months dead, and we were on our own now, my mother and kid brother and me. Ma was asleep in her room, Till was on the couch at the other end of our kitchen and sitting room, having had a bad dream of his own. He was thrashing in his blanket like a wildcat caught in a grain sack. Here came the wickering again, louder than would have been possible behind closed barn doors. Somehow our mules were out of their stalls and out of the barn. I peeled back my blanket, rose from my straw tick, and I got dressed as quickly and as quietly as possible. I glanced towards Ma's door and back to Till. They hadn't roused. Best to look into this without waking them. Ma called me the man of the house, though the expression was three sizes too big for me. I was a boy of 15. It meant she was counting on me. So I reached for my Mackinac coat and felt hat on the pegs by the door and I let myself outside. All was quiet except the burbling of Hermosa Creek and the breeze in the pines. I looked toward the barn, lit bright by the moon, and saw the door standing wide open. Well, at least the barn wasn't on fire. As I buttoned my coat against late September's keen night air, I heard a bit of clatter, and I looked in the other direction toward the train tracks that ran from Durango to Silverton. I was stunned by what I saw a rider in the moonlight heading out of our driveway and across the railroad tracks. He was turning north onto the wagon road. The rider was trailing a packed horse and two unloaded mules. The first as big a mule as you'll ever see, the second was spotted hind quarters, Hercules and Peaches, without a doubt. I was about to shout at the thief, but stifled the impulse. Do something fast, I told myself, and I ran towards the barn. At my pounding footsteps, our saddle horse whinnied nervously from her stall. Queenie, I called, and she nickered back. I had to calm her and feed her a handful of grain before she'd take the bit. Once bridled, Queenie led me to enter the moonlight and let, her, let me saddle her with no further objections. I tried to get a fix on the time of night. That shiny full moon had most of its arc yet to travel. It was still in the east, above the ridge and across the Animus River. Midnight, maybe? 
come daylight and that scoundrel would be long gone. Follow him, and then what? I didn't have a thread of a plan. I only knew that we would be sunk without those mules. I might be making a big mistake, but I had to take the risk. I fetched the lumber pencil I kept on the windowsill, grabbed a mill scrap, and I wrote in capital letters, Thief stole our mules, midnight. I'm headed north on Queenie. By the time I rode out of our place and took to the wagon road, the crook was out of sight. As I passed the settlement of Hermosa, there was nobody around, no lamp burning in the general store. Crossing the bridge over Hermosa Creek, I was about to urge Queenie into a trot, but held off as the Hermosa Creek Trail came to mind. In early August, a few weeks after our first day at the new place, I rode a couple miles up the creek trail. How far it went into the mountains, I had no idea. Any chance the rider had taken that trail instead of sticking to the wagon road? Silverton, if that's where he's heading, was 40 miles up the road. On the road, he'd be spotted for sure any number of times. Wouldn't he try to get off it as soon as he could? I went with my hunch and I started up that trail. Before long, I came to a stretch of soft dirt and puddled rainwater where I found what I was looking for, fresh tracks of mules as well as horses. A mule has a smaller hoof and ours were unshod, as were these. Now was the time to pick up the pace, but under the trees, the moonlight was scarce and the trail rocky and I had to bide my time. My mind went to the why and the wherefore behind the stealing. From our place, we'd seen mule teams pulling freight up the road to Silverton and unharnessed mules being driven in that direction. They were indispensable to the mining towns and especially the mines, far better suited to the work than horses or burrows and therefore of greater value. The gutter rat I was tracking had no doubt studied the excellent of our mules from the road and then waited on the full moon to do his dirty work. <clears throat> Remembering the squealing scream of terror I'd heard through my sleep, I wondered if he'd struck one of the mules. If so, I was hoping he was rewarded with a swift kick. A couple of hours up the trail, well past where I'd been before, I left the pines and I entered a long meadow bathed in moonlight. The high peaks above the forest came into view, already showing snow in the last week of September. The meadow was sprinkled with cattle, some up and grazing in the moonlight, and rounding a bend in the creek, I made out a fire in front of the trees at the far end of the meadow. Who would have a blazing fire in the middle of the night? Someone who'd recently arrived. What was my next move? Presume upon the better angels of his nature, I decided if he had any. As I neared the trees, I saw one man and two horses. The man was sitting on a log close to the fire. His horses were tethered to nearby branches, not hobbled and not in the corral between him and the creek. I couldn't make out his features yet. His floppy hat was pulled low, but he was aware of my approach. How could he not be as conspicuous as I was in the moonlight on the open ground? His black beard was cropped short. I spotted a rifle in its scabbard on the riding horse. The canvas panner bags off his pack horse were propped close at hand against the log. Evening, I said, as I drew closer yet. Not hardly, he grunted. I swung out of the saddle and walked a little closer, Queenie's reins in my hand. Hold it right there, he barked. He appeared to have a wad of tobacco in the side of his mouth. In that moment, I noticed his gun belt, and I tried not to show my alarm. He had a big revolver on his hip, maybe a Colt 45. A slab of meat was in his frying pan and was in his hand, but he wouldn't have been cooking coals anytime soon. Why such a hot fire? The night was cold, but not that cold. Any luck hunting? I asked. Get an elk? Just before dark, but what business is it of yours? Inviting yourself to supper? I've never seen an elk. I'm new in the country. Not interested in your life story and not looking for company. The man's cruel face and utter lack of civility were chilling, but I pressed on. 
We're farmers. We left good ground behind in eastern Kansas, pulled up stakes in favor of southwest Colorado after my father died of consumption. It's your misfortune and none of my own. Both my grandmothers died of it too. Ma calls it the family curse. We're, we're trying to make a new start here where the air is dry and we won't catch it. State your business, kid. He had some kind of metal rod propped on a rock. Its low end was in the fire. I, I won't keep you from your supper. The thing is, we're hanging on by the skin of our teeth and it cost us plenty to move our farm tools and animals out here. And the only way we can keep from going under is if we can sell our crops next summer. So? Our ground's never been plowed and our mules are missing. Huh, so this is what it's all about. You're wondering if I've seen your mules. I tracked them up this trail. Have you seen them? Here was his chance. It would be easy for him to say something like, as a matter of fact, I happened upon two stray mules. Got them tied up back in the trees. Ain't seen them. What do they look like? One's a great big gelding, dark brown, with white around his eyes and a white muzzle. The other is a gray female and has Appaloosa spots on her rump. Well, I'll keep an eye out. Please, mister, my mother and little brother and me aren't gonna make it without those mules. I already told you I'd keep an eye out, lest you're insinuating I stole him. Is, is that what you just did? There was a chance this man was plum as innocent. He could be an elk hunter. I had to take a chance. Hercules, I called real loud. Hercules knew it was me and whinnied back. Peaches, I cried, and she whinnied in return. The rustler rose to his feet. He was of medium height, lean and wiry, and the effort to rise had caused him to wince. Perhaps he had been kicked by a mule. They're back in the timber, I said. I'll just collect them and go. You saying I took them? No, sir, by no means. How were you to know they were there? Whoever took them is long gone. He spat a stream of tobacco juice into the fire, and then he drew his pistol. Get along, little doggy, or I'll leave your gut shot carcass for the coyotes. The way he said that last part, raising his voice as he leveled his gun at my heart, left little doubt. I saw it in his eyes. This was more than a threat. He was on the verge of pulling the trigger. I had to say something, but what? Sorry, I said, no offense intended. And I turned away quickly, hoping against hope he wouldn't shoot me in the back. I mounted up, wondering if I was drawing my last breath. I rode off slowly, trying not to show my fear and wondering all the while if he was reaching for his rifle. Those next couple minutes on that moonlit meadow took an eternity. If you'd like to check out City of Gold by Will Hobbs, you'll find it in our new fiction section in the children's room. We hope you'll come in and take a look.